All right, Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. I'm going to start from the very beginning of the Bible. We're going to read the whole Bible this morning. So um, that's why we're selling hot chocolate, and we'll have some blankets coming around about dinner time. So, um, and I will be reading it in the King James, just so you know. No, I won't. This is NIV. Um, I, for me, Genesis is, is, is the platform for um, everything. Okay, obviously... Um, there's a lot happening as you take the whole of Scripture and you put things together. And you hear me say this all the time, but one of the most dangerous things you can do is take bits and pieces and try to make a full theology or doctrine out of it. You have to take all that God is, who he is, what he's done, what it meant to people, who he was talking to, when he was talking to him, what the cultural uh, symbolism was. I mean, you can't just copy and paste stuff into our American understanding and think that you can draw conclusions without really studying the Word of God. Amen. I think you have to study the Word of God to really get a glimpse of what his heart really is. And for me, I, I, Genesis is one of my favorite places to start from. And um, I could start here every single Sunday, no matter what we're talking about, because I believe everything relates back to his heart and his intention. That being said, this morning I want to talk a little bit about voids. Everybody say voids. Did you say voids or voice? Void? Okay, I thought someone said voice. I was like, I might have not pronounced that good. Genesis 1, chapter, or, yeah, Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse number 1 in chapter 1. <laughs> it says this, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. In other translations it says uh, formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. I love pondering, and I, I, I'm cautious here as we maybe articulate certain things. You have to leave some things to ponder because he didn't write every detail of every single moment in the scripture for us, which means we can't possibly understand it all, but we can certainly ponder, just don't draw a conclusive theology about certain things. But I love pondering the Genesis narrative, the creation account, and I love just kind of imagining what that looked like. I have no idea what it looks like, but I love just thinking uh, or, or trying to think. I don't know that we can even almost begin to really relate to a complete formless void of nothing because as long as we've existed in this world there's always been something right I mean we're, we're born into a world where things already exist we hear things we see things this is before all of that right and this really shows how powerful God is that God is literally before anything we could perceive or understand of ever experienced God was there and if nothing else, that should make us so secure in the fact that he's before all things that nothing that is inside of those things should ever get your fear. They should never get your peace. They should never get you so stirred up that you can't come back to the one who was there before any of it even existed. That excites me, you know. The Bible says that the earth was formless and void. There was literally nothing. It was just a big hole, right? Right? God spoke, and he spoke light, and light began to shine. Like, for me, I sit and I think, what did that look like, though? There was nothing really to shine on yet. What does light shining in void look like? Think about it, right? I have no idea. I still don't know. I don't even know how to think about that. I just think, man, there's light, but usually we perceive light because we can see something, or we can see the effect of light on something. But what, what about when light's just shining into nothing? Nothing exists. God speaks, let there be light, and the light shows up. And he's like, yeah, that's good. I want to know what he saw. You know, what that looked like? Because he, he didn't make the ground yet for the light to reflect on so that you had definition and you had outline and you could start to kind of make things out. It was just light and light in the middle of something that wasn't there, right? But I think right off the bat, it's, fascinating to me that God's a God who fills voids. He's a God who fills spaces where there's nothing. He can always create something, okay? This is the basis of who he is. The first thing we see about him is that 
there's a situation of nothing and God can speak and change it all, right? I wonder how many people are struggling in their life with not necessarily knowing all the information or details about life or God or relationships or whatever it is we're dealing with, but I wonder how many people are struggling with the void that's there. And I wonder how many times we've got voids that we're trying to fill and we're not even aware that we're trying to fill it when, and again, this, will, this, this could be the punchline for the message this morning. I'll go ahead and tell it early because this is pretty basic, but I, I think we all know that Jesus is the only one that can fit that space, right? You ever play that game um, that, what's it called? The little game where you match the shapes? Anybody know? It's match shape game, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's like a little star, a little square, a little circle. Kids play it, and you got to put the thing in the right. What's it called? Perfection? That's religious. <laughs> Man. Whew. Is that a, it's not a, not a Christian, not a Christian game. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty easy to figure out that certain shapes fit certain places, Okay. Now, to, to kind of preface this a little bit, I think probably if you're a believer here this morning, if you've studied the word at all, if you've been in church any amount of time, you know that in the life of a believer, there's simply certain things that don't belong. Everybody good with that? We call it sin. We could call it character issues. Obviously, sin doesn't belong. Sometimes my character issues don't belong in the life of a believer. Sometimes my responses may not belong in the life of a believer. And sometimes the hard part for me is not that it doesn't belong or that I'm dealing. I just don't know what to do with my stuff sometimes. And so what I find myself doing is I have these little voids or areas that I'm not sure about or don't understand about myself. And I try to like um, either adapt it, change it, or put something there to make me feel like I'm good, right? Make me feel like it's okay. To make me just feel like I'm not empty and formless, right? I was thinking about that game a little bit this morning. And I play it every morning just to sharpen my mind. Um, but, but I was thinking, how often do we have that square shape and we take the circle and put in there, right? And what happens is, let's say, I should have bought one of those games this morning. But let's say we got a square about yay big, that's King James talk. And you take a circle that fits inside the square, what's the problem? Did the circle go inside the square? Sure. But what's still left? A void. Now you've got these little corners that aren't filled in. You've got these little areas. And where there was one big void, now you've got four little voids, right? Or maybe I take the star shape, and I'm not the brightest kid in the classroom, and I take that circle and I try to shove it in the star. Guess what does not happen? It will not go in that shape, right? Could I get it into that shape? Yes, you better believe it, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you know how I would do it? I was really thinking about this this morning. I would get me a razor blade, and I would, if I really wanted it to go in that spot, it doesn't belong there, but if I really wanted it to go, I would have to cut it, to make that shape fit in the shape that it doesn't go in. Everybody tracking with me. Which means that, in essence, I kind of damaged the game. So I can't take it back to Walmart. And I think probably more than we realize, we're trying to stuff shapes in areas of our life that they don't belong. And rather than trust God in certain situations, we try to push, push, push. And sometimes even in our own life, we're trying to self-modify so much that we're cutting ourselves to the point that we've become damaged just so we could fit one shape inside an area that doesn't belong. When the truth is there's a void. And there's a void that can only be filled one way by one person. And it doesn't matter how many times you read that book or go on that diet, or break that relationship, until the void is filled, all of your effort will always be a struggle. That makes sense this morning? 
I'm not saying don't try. I'm just saying you've, you, you've got to know what goes where. Otherwise, you'll be spending 40 years of your life trying to shove that circle into the star hole, and it just does not work. The only way it works is if there's damage, but even if you got it in there, there's still going to be pockets of void. You ever feel like you've had these just seasons of life and like maybe God's um, been really clear in some areas, but then there's other areas you're just trying to figure it out. And so you're trying stuff to figure out you know, how to like get on that better me, serve the Lord. You're doing it for the right reason, but you might be doing it the wrong way. You're doing it like maybe even using the right stuff, but it's the wrong time. You might have the right peace but it's the wrong spot, right? And you go through those seasons and you're fighting and you're doing so good and you're climbing that hill, you're standing on the word and it's great, but you you feel like, man, yeah, I'm, I'm like gaining ground, but there's still these like few corners where I'm just, I feel broken, you know, or, or I feel just empty, you know? This happens every week in church life all around the globe. People can go into a church, they can celebrate God, they can have that euphoric moment, which I think is a beautiful thing, and we can celebrate and sing, but then we can get in the middle of the week and we're just like, oh, there's a corner. And the first thing we do, unfortunately, is we start to question who God is and what he's like and how powerful he really is and what that sometimes does, it causes us to reduce our theology of what God has for us now and put it off to later because if it's not showing up now, it must mean that someday we'll be perfect, which is interesting, that game's called perfection, right? And then we think, well, man, I'm just going to struggle through life, get through life, and someday it's all going to be filled. And I do believe there's a great fullness coming, but I also believe Jesus paid for something and fit a piece into your life that if we will let him fill the void, we don't have to go through this life constantly trying to fill it ourselves and put pieces in that don't belong only to leave us still broken, damaged, because we had to cut stuff up to get it in there in the first place. It doesn't matter if you've read 50 steps to Christian Breakthrough 900 times. That's not a book. I just made it up. If you can't get a relationship with God that's working, there's no format or method in a Christian manual that will ever replace what only God can fill. Amen? Amen. See, I know for me, like, there's, there's areas of my life that are still void, right? And, I, and like, I, I love the Lord, have a great relationship with the Lord. I've, I know who he is. I know what that means. But it's not always there emotionally. It's not always there in action. It's not always, uh, let me tell you some actions, actually. And I promise Sundays aren't about me um, confessing my sin to you guys. But right now they are because my priest is on vacation. Um. He's on vacation because I wore him out, but um, I'm, I'm still in this, like, defense mode with pregnant, with pregnant boo-boo. Um, and guys, help me out, counsel me later if this is true or if I'm just off target, but I'm, I've got this, like, weird defense thing now, right? And so it's like I'm, um, if, if just... You know, like we're out in public. I think I shared probably a little snippet of this uh, a few weeks ago. If we're out in public and like anything threatening is around Boo Boo, I am on guard. You know, like I'm just, I'm ready to save the day and beat somebody up if I have to, right? And that's not Christian, right? Um, and all I would say before I tell the rest of the story is have grace on me because I know what I do is wrong. And I repent, okay? Um, But one time yesterday, (laughs) this is, you know, I was walking, you know, trying to just grow in the Lord yesterday. And thank God his mercies are new every morning. And I wasn't really like mad. I was just more like this defense thing fires on and I'm just ready to go to war, you know? And that's probably a good thing, but I feel I'm, I'm starting to realize maybe it's just in the wrong spot. And so we're, we were driving up um, to Boone yesterday to spend the day and do some things. And this um, giant, um, like, tour bus thing, right? Like, huge. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, like the big tour buses. All of a sudden, 
Should I tell this story? Yeah. She says, yeah. There's no secrets between us guys. That's all I'm saying. And I'm talking about us. Like, this giant tour bus all of a sudden just gets hot on our tail, just out of nowhere. Before I know it, he's cut over to this lane, and he swerves. I mean, and don't tell the cops, but I was, I was going a little over the speed limit. So it wasn't like I was slow or something, you know? So that part of me is like, oh, no, you don't. What, what's your problem, you know? And then I'm like, man, for God to love the world, that he gave his only. And I'm kind of doing my mantra. And this guy gets on this lane, and then he cuts us off to the point I have to swerve. And it was totally on purpose. I'm, I'm not going to, like, act like, oh, he didn't know. He knew. He knew. It was... It was John Wishon's tour bus. And I pulled up, and they were singing gospel songs. No. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> Here's what happened, though. Immediately, I'm, I'm just not happy. Because my only thought is, boo-boo and the baby. And they came from her side of the car, which even made it worse. And I'm not processing all this in the moment. I'm thinking about it as it unfolds. And before I know it, I'm laying on the horn. Here's the part you have to have grace for me. <laughs> and I pull up, and I'm stepping on it, and I get up by this guy at the red light. And I roll the window down. Poor boo-boo's just like, oh, gosh. <laughs> She's kind of doing this. And I know what you're thinking. You can't be like, you know, getting mad at people because you're going to ruin your witness. Don't worry. I always wear a mask when I'm, you know, you know, telling people off. I'm always, I've always got some disguise on. Um, but I pull up and I'm not like furious. I'm just defensive. I'm like, you did not just do that with my boo-boo and baby in the car. I will jack you, son. You know, like that kind of moment. So I pull up, I roll the window down, and Kara's just embarrassed, you know. And nevertheless, my will not hers be done. And I'm, I'm rolling the window. I'm looking at this guy. He's up in this tour bus. Because you can't drive like that when you're driving a tour bus. That's crazy. It's reckless, right? And I don't even know why I said this. I don't know. It wasn't a bad word, so I'm doing better than most of y'all. But <clears throat> I look at him, and he looks. He didn't want to make eye because he knew. He knew what he did. He just didn't think I was going to follow him, right? And I didn't know I was going to follow him. It's just that shepherd thing in me. <laughs> and I look up into the window, and here's what I said. I mean, I yelled it, not like like road rage yell, just more, hey, we need to have a conversation about what just happened. You know, like, there's something wrong with you. But I look at him, I said, are you stupid? <laughs> and that's what I said. Now, here's the problem. He didn't want to talk about it. He wouldn't look me in the eye, and we never got to resolve that, so I'm still processing emotionally. Now, most of you say, well, you can't be a pastor anymore. And I would say, well... Uh, are you stupid? Um, <clears throat> no. <laughs> but obviously there's areas of our life sometimes that just function, and we don't know why they function. You can process it later, but it doesn't keep that little pocket from showing up sometimes, right? And what I know I'm, I'm kind of realizing is sometimes you're frustrated because home dog and his tour bus cut you off the road, and you got to swerve with your pregnant wife. Not a good, I'm still kind of getting mad about it as I'm telling you the story. <laughs> But I, I know what we're saying. We're saying, well, that's not Christian. No, what, wasn't, what, what really was good is that I didn't pull him out of the bus and give him a whooping. That's what, that's what uh, you know, the old me would have done. But I'm growing, okay? And praise God for it. But there's this frustration that I'm getting while she's pregnant and defensiveness that I'm almost like, I'm just like on this thing, like, okay, just mess with Boo Boo one time, somebody, because I need to get this out, you know? And the problem is, it's not a bad emotion to feel protected. It's just where I put it that becomes the issue. Where I allow it to show up and where I try to fit it into, that's where it becomes 
an issue. And so rather than being so frustrated that I want to challenge a, a tour bus driver, in other words, in, in, instead of letting that protective kind of you know, thing show up as conflict, it's probably healthier that I let it show up as provision and trying to provide for my family and putting my energy and drive there rather than my energy in chasing down bus drivers. But sometimes we've got the right pieces. We're just putting them in the wrong spots and they're showing up in the wrong place because there's certain voids that we're leaving and we feel broken and we feel like we're letting ourselves down or letting people down or we feel like we're not progressing because we had a moment. And it's not that we're not progressing. It's just that that game has more than just one shape. And part of it is you've got to get them all in there. And sometimes I feel like I'm just putting it in the wrong spot, you know? You know what's amazing about God is there'll never be any situation, there'll never be any challenge, there'll never be any moment of our life that he doesn't have the peace or answer for. There's not going to be one void that he can't supply the need for, not one time. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the one who can provide for every circumstance, no matter what it is, no matter what emotional needs you have, no matter what financial needs you have, no matter what relational needs you have, no matter what job needs you might have. God has an answer for every single spot on the board. I've realized, though, at least for me, maybe you, my challenge is I'm usually trying to fit the pieces in myself, and I can't see the shapes as good as he can, Yeah. So I find areas in my life where I've shoved a piece in there to make it fit, but it's still got issues around it, you know? It's got moments. Another, <clears throat> another protective story is there's a nail, by the way. Saved you guys. There was a, a couple weeks ago, Boo Boo texted me. And this is still the protective. I'm still in that mode for a minute. I worked myself up. She texted me and she had gotten lunch somewhere. I won't say where. <laughs> but she texted me and I'm at the building working. And she texted me this picture says, I was eating my lunch and it just felt weird. Finally, I cleaned the sauce off the chicken. She sent me this picture of just straight, I mean, completely 100% raw chicken. And of course, I'm thinking, you can't be pregnant eating raw chicken. No, that's not good. You can't be eating raw chicken, not pregnant. But of course, then I'm mad. Who in the world would dare serve boo boo, pregnant boo boo, raw chicken? <clears throat> so I stop what I'm doing. I drive up to this restaurant. And I know what you're thinking. You're going to ruin your witness and ruin our church. No, I'm not, because I put my mask on, and I went up there. And I said, hi, my name is Jody Edmiston. I would like to complain. And I'd like to tell you guys. No. <laughs> I drove up there anyway, and I was nice about it. it I mean, I'm sure it was an accident, but somebody's got to know. I said, you gave this to my pregnant wife. Now we got to call the doctor, see what they say. If they got a pumper stomach, you're paying for it. You know, pretty nice conversation. That one I handled pretty well, I thought, you know. Got this pregnant thing that I'm just almost looking for ways to dispense it, right? It's a little upset, kind of bothered me. Because I thought, man, what, what nerve of somebody to, like, just mess with boo-boo like that, you know? bothers me, triggers me. But the beautiful thing about situations like this, not that you shouldn't act, I think if somebody serves your wife raw chicken, men, you should go up there with a baseball bat. No, don't do that. But, <laughs> but you know, business is business, amen. Um, <laughs> no, I was like, I don't know if we can do that, but I'm going to let you know. I'll probably always be that guy. Um, there's these areas, though, where I've got this stuff in my life, but I just don't know what to do with it. And when you don't know what to do with certain areas of your life, whether it's a protective thing, whether it's, um, maybe for you it's an anger. Anybody deal with anger? Don't raise your hand. You deal with just anger, right? Do you know there, there is a righteous anger? Do you know that it's okay to be angry about injustice? 
It's what you do with anger and how it shows up that becomes the issue. Anger in and of itself isn't the worst thing in the world. It can drive you into greatness. It can drive you into serving God. It can drive you into seeing injustice become justice, right? It can drive you into feeding the hungry. It can drive you into a lot of things. Like you can get angry about the fact that kids every day on this planet don't have enough food. That makes me angry. Yeah? Makes me angry. But sometimes I've got that peace that could be used for the good of the kingdom, but I just put it in the wrong areas. And I don't put it in the wrong areas intentionally. Most of the time I don't even evaluate or know that I'm doing it. But when I do evaluate it, I start to realize it's not just that I put it in the wrong areas. I'm putting it in the wrong areas because somewhere I've got an area in me that's not been filled yet. Right? See, I want Jesus to not just be the idea of provision over my life. And when I say provision, I don't, just, I don't mean just money and security and all this stuff. I, I want God to be the provision of everything going on in my life. I want God to be the provision of my emotional health my physical health, my financial health, my relational health. I want God to be the provision for everything. Part of that is he teaches us to steward what's been given, and so it does require us to grow, change, be pliable under the hand of the Lord. He is the part of we are the clay, and sometimes that's not the most fun thing. But I refuse to hide behind my personality traits or little moments and say, well, that's just who I am. I don't want to just always be who I am. I want to be who God says I am. And that requires God filling the voids that only he can fill rather than me trying to stuff things in there. Yeah? It's easy when you don't feel all that God is to start to rely. Not that God can't use situations and things, but I think more often we realize we're trying to supplement what only God has with other things because we just don't feel. We don't feel like what the Word says is good enough. Not intentionally. It's not like we don't like the Word. It's just when we talk about righteousness, peace, and joy, we don't always feel like righteousness, peace, and joy. Right? But the worst thing you can do is run to a supplement rather than run to Him first. Yeah? See, when someone cuts you off in traffic like bus driver, part of maturing as a believer isn't that you don't have certain responses. It's what you do with those responses that matter. It's not that you get a little bit defensive. It's do you take that frustration to the Lord or do you ask someone if they're stupid? No, obviously I failed the test yesterday, okay? Um. But I'll try again soon. (laughs) I don't ever want to let my frustrations become the currency that I use to relate to people. Because that means I'm not taking my frustrations to the Lord. Yeah. Hmm. And usually I'm frustrated because there's a void that I haven't let him really fill. But I've tried to stuff in there to get, stuff things in there to get by. But I've still got pockets. You ever like, um, anybody ever like put insulation in a house, like walls or anything? Our house right now is like, we've got two rooms we're, we're kind of living in, and the main floor is just down to studs. There's no insulation. So I'm like having to play this little game with our heat and air to run it like, I mean, it just stay cold in that section of the house, but if I don't set it at a certain temp, it'll be like 90 degrees in the one section we, where we're keeping the door shut. And so I'm playing this little game because what happens is when there's no insulation, everything's just kind of seeping out, so you're blowing heat in, but it's all just kind of evaporating and all the little cracks and voids and crevices. And um, Someone asked me one time, because I'm going to this older house, has like the plank uh, walls on the outside. Thankfully, there's brick, too, so that's helping a little bit. But I'm, I, I bought this uh, spray foam gun a couple years ago. And I just go around, and I, before I insulate anything, I seal every single crack and every single wall and floor and all that good stuff, right? Mainly so that there's not little bits of air getting through, but also so there's not little, uh, little bugs getting through, right? 
we would unlike bugs. And someone asked me to walk into the house. I was like, is that really necessary? And I looked at him. I said, are you really necessary? Um, <laughs> because, because here's what happens when you insulate something. If you just cut a shape or if you just, let's say you leave an inch gap anywhere in whatever cavity you're filling. You didn't properly insulate because that one inch gap has a lot bigger bleeding factor than you realize. And most houses are inefficient because there's the little cracks. Not because there's not insulation, it's just not always filling the void. And it may not always be in the right place. So all those little cracks combined cause you to spend a lot of money trying to heat a house that's losing heat, right? And sometimes the stuff we've filled the void with, we start to find out really is just costing us more, all right? We feel like we did all this work, we gained all this ground, we tried so hard, yet it's still costing me. It, I'm still losing somewhere. I feel like I'm just not getting the quality that I invested in, right? And it might not be that you have the wrong piece, it's just are you putting it in the right spot? I don't want my frustrations to go in the wrong place. I don't want my anger to show up in the wrong place. When you've got that stuff happening in your life, it's not because you are just a horrible, horrible believer. It's just because he's growing us to know how to steward the things that are functioning in our life. Some things in the life of a believer just do not belong, right? Sin does not belong in my life. Doesn't mean there's not grace if you're struggling. Doesn't mean there's not mercy if you're struggling. It just means ultimately it will never work and bring righteousness, peace, and joy. It will never, ever satisfy one shred of your life. It will only cause pain. It will only cause brokenness. But there's grace to get out of it, amen? But even above sin, there's other things in my life that just don't belong in the life of a believer, right? Let's read a... In other passages, because I feel like the Bible was so vast in its, obviously, text, but there's so much going on that if you don't take the whole picture, it's hard to see what God's really about. You can get his heart misinterpreted. We said in the beginning there was nothing and God spoke and there was light and that was really good. He saw that it was good. He liked it. But John 1, verse 1, starts out by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I think this is where we still are in the age of church that we're in, is we're still in that place of not really totally, and we're getting there, this isn't like a we're not good speech, but we're, we're at that place where it's dawning on us who we are in the Father. It's dawning on us what the gospel really did. It's dawning on us what Calvary really did. It's dawning on us that God really does love you, not just tolerate you. And what that means to be a son and daughter bought by the adopted blood of Jesus Christ. There's something about that that is so true and it is the only thing that will fill every single crack, crevice, and void and keep you from losing all the time, keep you from having to pay costly for all the stuff that you feel is just leaking out of your house every day or keep you from trying to stuff things in the wrong compartment because he will fill every void if we let him, right? But it's dawning on us, and we're in the middle of that journey. We're not totally there yet. No one's totally there yet. Jesus was the only one who walked out. Let me say it like this. Jesus was that perfection game, but before they opened it. Every piece was in its position, And then Acts chapter 2 shows up, and he just threw the game in the air, and all the pieces went everywhere, right? 
But he was so secure to do it because he knew that what he had done would always outweigh what we could ever do. And if we would always be able to bring our stuff back to that one piece that's universal, that one shape that was universal for all mankind, which was the cross, if we could bring our stuff to that one void that was Calvary and just put it there, it would always fit no matter how many times we need to do it. I can always go back to the place and put my stuff. See, it's only the blood of Jesus can fill every single void of your life. They're in this place where humanity is born. It's uh, broken because of a lie. It starts to spin out of control, but God still loves the world. He still loved humanity. He still has an intention. And I don't believe that when God starts something, mankind can mess it up if God really wants to do it. I don't believe our, our, our free will will ever trump The sovereign will of God. Mankind begins to kind of teeter out of control and God makes these agreements and covenants with the children of Israel. Fast forwarding through all this, but the Bible says, I think it's in Colossians and in Hebrews, that basically all that they went through, the observations, the law, was a shadow of things to come. It was a shadow. So they were constantly in this position of not really, they could see the shape, right? Right? They could see the shape like uh, in, in a shadowy kind of, uh, kind of way, and they could see like God's intent a little bit, even though it was kind of blurry, but they were always having to try to fit pieces in there year after year, day after day, trying to wash to be good enough, trying to offer sacrifices to be good enough, and it didn't matter how many times they brought a goat or a lamb or a dove, it would never completely fill the void. It might fit in some areas, but there was always a gap left. And we live in a day where the gospel, I think, is getting more um, just defined by the heart of the Father, and it's getting preached more uh, defined, and it's probably causing riffraff in the church globally a little bit, but praise God that the gospel is advancing, not our interpretation of everything is advancing, because what the world needs to know is that God's love for you is not based on you, it's based on Him. You can't break God's capacity to love just because you broke you. The world needs to know that God wants to fill the void in their life. And that's a, that's a tough conversation because you can't just tell someone, oh, okay, cut and paste, done. No, it's relationship. It's being able to get up every single day, listen to God, and learn how to walk in sync with him and say, God, here's where I'm at today. How, what do I do with this? That's how we grow. We don't grow because we don't have temptation or struggle we grow because we learn what to do with it that's what jesus was a master of right he's praying in the garden it's tempting for him to just evade the cross but he says nevertheless if it be your will not mine it's a moment he was tempted but he knew what to do with his temptation yeah they're living in that shadow of trying to put pieces and pieces and pieces together we live in this moment of light where light shines in the darkness yeah I, I parallel these, and this might be too abstract for a Sunday morning, but it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and he spoke, let there be light. In other words, there was nothing. But then you read this in John, and it's almost like the Genesis account again. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Nothing was made without him. It was very in sync. It was very in tune, and he said, let there be light. And that light was the life of men. That life was the light of men. It was Jesus. You know what probably the most vulnerable void to fill in your life is? The darkness. You know the hardest part for me in this whole journey called life? It's those dark areas. I don't mean sin dark. I mean dark as unknown where there's not anything, there's no, there's no reference point for me to figure out where I'm at or why I am the way that I am. I don't have, I don't have anything to latch on to. And you know what God does with those dark voids? He did it again in John. It says light shines in the darkness. Darkness didn't understand it. But he didn't just fill your void with a shape. He filled it with light. And that light is the life that life is the light. 
Does that make sense this morning? That means there is a promise, there is a quality of life that Jesus paid for and injected. That no matter how off my pieces are, I refuse to settle for less than the quality of life that God has for me. And I want to encourage us this morning, if you've got areas of your life or voids or places where the pieces may be in the wrong spot or you've tried to shove them in yourself or you've just got areas where like, I just don't even get all this. I'm not telling you it's easy to figure it out or play the game. I'm just telling you that God's faithful. And I'm telling you that it doesn't matter how many voids you have, he has the answer. There's nothing you've done that will ever, ever trump what he did at Calvary. Nothing. Amen. Amen.